Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Nadine Strossen. Nadine, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to be back, Brendan. I've, I'm really delighted to have you on. I talk about and write about freedom of speech a lot, uh, but I thought I really wanted to have a new, longer form discussion about where things are at with freedom of speech at the moment in the US, also in Europe, in the UK as well. And what better person to do that with than you? People will know that you were the president of the American Civil Liberties Union in the 1990s and the 2000s, right through to 2008, I think. The first woman to lead the ACLU. People will also know that you've been writing about freedom of speech for a very long time and campaigning on freedom of speech as well. Uh, Your most recent book was Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship. And I know you have another book coming out with the Oxford University Press this year, Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know. So hopefully I can ask you a bit about that later on, what we can expect in that book. Um, But to kick things off, I want to ask you how you would take the temperature of freedom of speech at the moment. It's always in a bit of peril. We know, you know better than anyone, that freedom of speech must always be fought for. It's never secure. But how do you think things are at the moment? Is there a crisis with freedom of speech? Are things bad? Are things looking up? What's your sense of how things currently stand? Thank you so much, Brendan, for the opportunity to participate in this very important podcast, which I enjoyed listening to. I'm going to answer mostly from the perspective of the United States Mm -hmm. because I spent most of my time reading and speaking about what is going on here. That said, I do really keep abreast, uh, at least in general, of developments, certainly in the Anglosphere, not only the UK, but also Canada, Australia. Australia, New Zealand, uh, as well as Europe and other parts of the world. For this reason, let me let me say this, Brendan, that uh, I have had such enormous worldwide interest in my book mm-hmm. and on the issues discussed in my book that I have been invited to speak, sometimes by Zoom, sometimes in person all over the world, virtually every continent. So um, I will focus on the United States, but I really do believe that what I say is at least generally applicable uh, in in most, if not all, of the rest of the world. So I, I like to start uh, the answer to this uh, uh, common and important question by quoting the famous opening lines in Charles Dickens' The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Mm-hmm. Let me start with the good news, the best. In Here in the United States, although we have a Supreme Court that has cut back on other rights that some of us consider to be fundamental. The court continues to be extremely strongly protective of the most controversial speech, speech that polls show that substantial pluralities, if not majorities, of Americans want to censor, uh, including hate speech, including extremist speech, including sexual or pornographic speech. And yet the court, all across its very broad ideological spectrum, continues to strongly enforce what it has called the bedrock principle of free speech, viewpoint neutrality, that it is not for the government to pick and choose which viewpoints, ideas, messages will be purveyed and which will not be, that in a democratic society, that is a decision for individual people to make. So that's the good news. Where it is the worst of times, Um, And I'm not sure it's worse than any other time, but let's just say it's very, very bad. It's never been worse during my decades of crusading on these issues is in the um, in the culture. Uh, We have come to be so familiar with the term cancel culture over the last few years despite debates about exactly what it means and what its limits are. I think everybody knows that um, public opinion surveys continue to show extremely high levels of self-censorship in the U.S., all across the ideological spectrum, every age group, race, gender, uh, you name it. Uh, There are some differences which are interesting, but disturbingly high numbers across all of those identity vectors 
also across the uh, you know the partisan spectrum. And especially troubling is that we see this extreme self-censorship reported in the particular context where one would hope for free speech to be especially strongly supported, namely college and university campuses among faculty members and students. And, you know, we can't have a meaningful exercise of our legally protected free speech speech rights if we're afraid to talk about, and the subjects that we are afraid to talk about, Brendan, you won't be surprised, are the important ones <laughs> that are sensitive and, and, you know, no coincidence, race and gender and immigration policy and police policy. And the fear of discussing those topics uh, because one is afraid of being accused, whether falsely or not, of being as one of my friends puts it, some kind of an ist or some kind of an ob, uh, people shut up. And and this is deeply damaging for democracy as well as it is for individual liberty, not to mention for equality, right? You can't have a meaningful, equal opportunity to participate as a citizen uh, if you are engaged in self-censorship. Yeah, that's a really useful outline of where things stand, uh, particularly in relation to the United States. But I think it reflects uh, a broader trends in Anglo-American society and in much of the Western world, particularly your comments about what's happening in the culture. Because uh, as many people have argued throughout modern history, including the leaders of the ACLU, if freedom of speech is not loved in the culture or held up in the culture, then it almost doesn't matter, or, or at least it weakens the fact that it is being defended in the legal sphere, because you want that cultural appreciation and that cultural validation off the freedom to speak, the freedom to express dissent, the freedom to have those important discussions. So I want to ask you about some of that cultural crisis in relation to freedom of speech and, and how we got here. And I, I did want to ask you to kick that part of it off uh, about Salman Rushdie. Now, um, I think your new book is is dedicated to Salman Rushdie. He's in the news again because he did a an interview with The New Yorker last week, which was really the first time he's spoken publicly and, and been seen publicly since the grotesque medieval attack on him in August in New York State last year, which let's remind ourselves, he was stabbed almost a dozen times. He lost a sight in one eye for the crime of writing a novel, the satanic verses that the Ayatollahs in Iran were offended by. I mean, we really do have to explain just the uh, obscenity of what has happened. And we have to remind your listeners that at least one person who was involved with the book was killed. Yeah. Others were attacked and survived. And um, these include the translators and the publishers of his book, because the fatwa, the religious edict for uh, the death penalty, if you will, is applied not only to Rushdie himself, mm -hmm. but to anybody who's co connected with the publication or distribution of the book. Absolutely. So you've met Rushdie, you've signed the Harper's letter in 2020, that the letter that was calling out cancel culture and defending freedom of speech, and Salman Rushdie signed that too. He's been a long-standing defender of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of conscience. But I wanted to ask you, in relation to the cultural dynamic of the new censorship, after his attack in August, there was a flurry of concern. There was a lot of newspaper coverage. He's a very well-known person, and he was violently attacked. But it did seem to me to dissipate quite quickly. We didn't see a, a Je suis Salman movement in the way one might have expected. There were some public readings here and there, but there wasn't the groundswell of literary anger or um, community anger or or just the kind of stalwart defense of his right to use his, his imagination as he sees fit. And it did have echoes of when the fatwa was first issued in the late 1980s, when Again, there were there was a reluctance in sections of the literary establishment and the political establishment to stand shoulder to shoulder with Salman Rushdie against the Ayatollahs. There's another element to that pattern, if I may, Brandon, yeah. in which Rushdie played a role, although a somewhat different role, which is when PEN America, a wonderful 
or organization, which has is part of a worldwide uh, movement of, of writers. It, it operates at the intersection of literature and, and journalism and free speech. And Rushdie was uh, recently the, the president of that organization. And, and Penn ha- was very outspoken in Britain throughout his ordeal during the 10 years when he was in hiding. Um, his memoirs give a lot of tribute to Penn, and Penn has been outspoken on his behalf since then. But after the attacks on on, on Charlie Hebdo, uh, Penn was going to honor and, and ultimately did honor the uh, the magazine uh, and, as a tribute to those who had been brutally killed. But a, it was over enormous opposition from within the literary community itself. A petition was signed with, I believe, hundreds of names, including writers I found very shocking, writers that American writers that I had always thought stood four square for free speech. And and the argument basically was uh, the, the key phrase was punching down. You may not punch down uh, when you are engaging in satire or, or critical discussion, and you know put aside whether it's punching down to attack uh, 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 Ayatollah, who has seemingly boundless political and religious power. Rushdie just so courageously and eloquently, you know, responded to that uh, attempt to deny the award. So he has been not only embodying in his own work and the way he lives his life, um, the values of freedom, including the values to criticize and, and including the value to punch down. I mean, yeah. he really <laughs> is an absolutist. He keeps saying in, in ways far more eloquent than I can, that if you start drawing these lines, that's the end of freedom of speech. That's the end of creativity. I haven't yet had a chance to read the new book, but from the excerpts indicate that that message comes through loud and clear in this new book, as as well as in so many of his prior works. Yeah, so I wanted, I, I completely agree about, you know, if we're serious about freedom of speech, it must include punching down. Although I've always been struck by the idea that criticism of Islam, which is a billion strong world religion, that that is necessarily punching down. You know, you could argue that you couldn't punch much higher than God, much higher than Allah, and I think uh, defending people's right to criticize religion is so important to the to the cause of freedom of speech. But on on Rushdie, both the lackluster response I think from the cultural elites uh, when he was attacked last August, and then the lackluster response to the fatwa itself. Although there was also a furious support for Rushdie from sections of the uh, literary elites back then as well. Um, How much of a turning point do you think this was in terms of the new kinds of censorship that you've been talking about and analysing for 30 or 40 years? I'm thinking, you know, um, Jonathan Rausch's book, The Kindly Inquisitors, that was published in 1993, which posited this idea that we were entering into a new form of inquisition where it was done in a kindly way, in quote marks. You know, it was done to defend people from offence and particularly to protect minorities from offence. And of course, Jonathan Rausch's book was very much influenced by the fatwa and the lacklustre response to the fatwa. You also spent a lot of the 1990s looking at new forms of censure and speech control, often which was often pushed under the guise of political correctness or ensuring... Um, equality of esteem between different groups in society. So do you think that the Rushdie affair opened the floodgates to those new forms of censorship and the the cultural crisis of freedom that, that you're talking about? You know, very interesting questions, Brendan, because Jonathan Rauch recently told me, to my shock, that his book, The Kindly Inquisitors, was not well received. He told me he was eternally grateful to me for blurbing the book because other people refused to do so. And uh, the book was brought out again on either the 20th or the 25th anniversary. And at that point was what was much better received. But I hadn't realized how his message was falling on so many deaf ears um, early on. Uh, you know, 
Let me say this. I have been, to me, it seems to me I've been fighting the same battles eternally, and I am in no position really to gauge whether it's better or worse. It's only anecdotal observations. It is bad. It is much worse than it should be. If it has been even worse in past periods, such as the Cold War, well, uh, so what? We should have, uh, we, we should progress. We should not regress. I mean, I use the Cold War example advisedly because a number of people have been contending that the kind of cancel culture that is going on now with enormous retribution, um, tangible retribution, including against faculty members with tenure who are losing their jobs and and other uh, really concrete, painful sanctions. Some studies indicate that the numbers now are worse than they were during McCarthyism and the Cold War. But putting it aside, uh, let me let me give you one indicator. Uh, FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. There, by the way, parenthesis, there's a bellwether of how we're doing. This is an organization that was founded to deal with free speech issues on campus back in the 90s, as you alluded to with the advent of hate speech codes and so-called the political correctness movement. Uh, Because what started on campus has not stayed on campus, as uh, Greg Lukianoff and and Jonathan Haidt uh, described so brilliantly in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, there's been a lot of pressure on FIRE to expand its work on free expression into the larger public sphere. Last year, it decided to do that. Uh, fortunately, is in the process of expanding its staff enormously, uh, but its mission is now uh, described by the, the same acronym, uh, but it now stands for its Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. And one of the projects that it's, it's still focusing very heavily on campus, as well as the larger sphere, and one of its recent projects has been to chronicle in detail every single incident of an attempt to retaliate against a faculty member for exercising what should be constitutionally protected speech. Uh, It's a very granular database for any of your listeners who are interested. I urge them to look at the FIRE website and you can see the individual details. And it's now up to the hundreds, uh, even most disturbing. And this is just looking in the last few years. Since 2015, I can't remember the exact number, but it's dozens. I mean, even one would be shocking. Tenured professors who have lost their jobs over constitutionally protected speech. So one of my pet peeves is when people, often on the left, say, oh, there's no such thing as cancel culture. That is just an exercise of free speech. It is just criticism. It's not just criticism. I, of course, defend the free speech right to engage even in defamatory criticism. Uh, But where I draw the line is when the criticism, quote unquote, is so harsh and calls for punitive responses, that is clearly going to have a disproportionate silencing effect uh, on people on campus. Now, let me throw in one other point. Well, first of all, what's happening on campus is also happening in the larger sphere. So we're starting with the numbers on campus and then FIRE will branch out beyond that in its database. Um, But the, the these attacks are coming from all across the ideological spectrum. In the United States um, for reasons that I leave to political scientists and and who knows, cultural anthropologists, uh, it is mostly the right-leaning media that is covering these issues. And so you get a disproportionate sense of, oh, it's the progressives on campus that are silencing uh, those that are moderate or conservative or, you know, to the right, 
Uh, but in fact, FIRE's database demonstrates that while a predominant number of these in, uh, cancellation incidents come from the left, a substantial percentage are also coming from the right. It's about 60-40. And for some reason, the mainstream liberal media are not covering that. And we have this distorted um, view. It was summarized very well in a FIRE publication. Uh, um, cancel the the right attacks cancel culture without acknowledging that it too is engaging in cancel culture. The left denies that cancel culture exists without acknowledging that it too is subject to cancel culture. We're never going to solve any of these free speech problems, Brendan, unless we will all accept that we all have a stake in it left, right, and center, you know, black, white, yellow, green, no matter who you are, no matter what you believe. One of the reasons I love learning about history is because it helps me to understand the present. History provides a roadmap of how our society has evolved, the challenges it has faced, and how it overcame them. I know I wouldn't be half the journalist I am today without the knowledge I've accumulated about the past. To give you one example, we regularly write about anti-Semitism on Spiked, and understanding the deep roots that this racism has in Western society is really important if we're going to understand why it keeps making an appearance in modern times as well, sometimes in seemingly unexpected places. So it was really good to see an episode on the medieval origins of anti-Semitism as part of Wondrium's brilliant series, The Medieval Legacy. This eye-opening 36-part series covers so much more as well. From chivalry and warfare to bureaucracy and the development of the rule of law, The Medieval Legacy is a must-listen for anyone wanting to understand how today's world is still influenced by its pre-modern past. It is just one of the many brilliant series available to download or stream on Wondrium. Wondrium is hands down my favorite educational platform. It has documentaries, series, lessons, how-tos, and much more covering just about any topic you and I could imagine. I highly recommend signing up for Wondrium. There is a huge selection of videos, more than 8,000 hours. There is the flexibility to switch to audio only, which is great for multitasking. The quality is superb. The programs are expert led. They're easy to follow. They're beautifully filmed and it is completely accessible. I can watch or listen on my phone, my tablet, my TV or my computer. And there are no commercials, no tests, and no stress. It's just the enjoyment of learning. Learn about what you love and love learning about it with Wondrium. Do what I did. Sign up for Wondrium now. And right now, my listeners can get two years of Wondrium for the price of one. It is a fantastic deal, but it is only available if you sign up through my special URL. Go to wondrium.com slash Brendan. That's W O N D R I U M dot com slash Brendan. Wondrium dot com slash Brendan. That's a, a useful description of how things lie in the UK as well. I mean, the, the cases we hear about most in relation to cancel culture tend to be the ones that are pushed by zealous so called leftists on campus. They want to silence Jermaine Greer because she doesn't think that a man can become a woman. They want to silence anyone who criticizes policies of mass immigration. They want to even silence really ridiculous things like people who are not from a Latino background who wear sombreros, for example. And you hear about these ridiculous cases all the time of things being cancelled. But among the right as well, even though they criticise left-wing cancel culture, they also engage in cancel culture. So the Tory government here at the moment, the, the right-wing government that we have, is pushing through a new bill, the online harms bill, that would mm -hmm. make it difficult to say certain things on the internet and which would give greater power to social media companies to censor supposedly hateful or problematic content. Um, right-wingers will often fume if an extreme Islamist speaks on campus or a revolutionary Marxist. And as you so articulately say, if you believe in freedom of speech, you believe in freedom of speech, and that has to go across the board. And I, in relation to that very issue, I wanted to, you've mentioned hate 
speech, which is something we hear about all the time. And so many episodes of cancel culture are now justified in the language of combating hate speech, combating hate. And uh, your most recent book published in 2018 was Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship. And the one thing that I've, I admire many things about you, but one of the things I admire most is that you don't draw the line at hateful speech and you do defend freedom for hatred, freedom for people to express hateful ideas. And I wonder if you could just explain to listeners why you think that's an important thing for, for you to do. Well, it's important for me to do because if I want any speech to be protected at all, that protection has to encompass the most controversial speech. Nobody tries to censor popular, sweet little nothings, right? Um, the, the, the strength of free speech is proven by its extension to the thought that we hate, uh, to paraphrase Oliver Wendell Holmes, a great Supreme Court justice. Uh, personally, it's important to me, and I think it uh, has an impact on people when I explain that I have a personal reason for loathing hate speech, in particular fascist Nazi speech, because uh, my beloved father, who was born in Berlin as a so-called half-Jew under the uh, Nuremberg, racist Nuremberg laws was in a concentration camp in Germany, nearly died and was uh, ultimately liberated by Americans just one day before he was scheduled to be sterilized, uh, literally because of the Nazis eugenics program. So I literally owe my life as well as my my liberty to um, the, uh, the crushing of, of Nazism. Uh, that said, if I thought, and here I'm going to associate myself, Brendan, with one of my human rights heroes, Arie Nair, who was the longtime executive director of the ACLU. He went on on to become the founding executive director of Human Rights Watch and from there Open Society Foundation, truly one of the giants in international human rights uh, in this century and the last century. Arie was the, he himself was a Holocaust survivor, born in Germany in 1937. His entire extended family was slaughtered. His immediate family escaped uh, delay, belatedly after suffering horrible ordeals. Uh, Arie led the ACLU during the famous so-called Skokie case in the late 1970s, which really epitomizes this concept of viewpoint neutrality, which I've referred to several times as the bedrock of our First Amendment strong free speech protection. Um, the, in Skokie, Illinois, is a town near Chicago that has a large Jewish population. At the time in the late 1970s, it had a large percentage of those Jews were actually Holocaust survivors. For that reason, not surprisingly, a group of neo-Nazis wanted to demonstrate their anti-Semitic messages in, in Skokie, right, to get the most attention. And when there was an attempt to censor them, the ACLU came to the defense of their free speech rights. Um, of course, the ACLU um, considers the Nazis' views absolutely antithetical to civil liberties, but we were putting into operation the defense of freedom, even for the thought that we hate. It was a hands-down winner in the courts of law, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court because of the viewpoint neutrality principle, but it was very controversial in the court of public opinion. The ACLU itself, you know, a group of people who feel so strongly about civil liberties, including free speech, that they become card-carrying members, we lost 15% of our members, people who said, I really believe in strong free speech, except for this uniquely odious speech. And I, I go into all this detail, Brandon, because it shows how enormously challenging it is to persuade even diehard free speech supporters that 
even hate speech should be protected. Anyway, shortly after that case, Arie wrote a wonderful book about it uh, called Defending My Enemy, The Risks of Freedom. And I reread it every couple of years, and it really stands the test of time. He makes so many good points, but the one I was leading up to, which I completely endorse from my own perspective, is this. He says, look, you know, much as I love free speech, I loathe the Nazis even more than I love free speech. So if I thought that censorship would help defeat Nazism, I would be all in favor of it. The fact of the matter is, though, no matter how well intended the censorship is, it is at best ineffective and at worst counterproductive. So during the Weimar Republic, the period in Germany when the Nazis rose to power, they had very strict anti-hate speech laws, which were very strictly enforced. And in many Nazis served time in prison, but they loved it. It was a propaganda platform for them, where they attained attention that they never would have otherwise and sympathy that they otherwise never would have. We see that today when hate mongers are always seeking the limelight and organizations that specialize in countering hate, such as the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Anti-Defamation League, are constantly advising people, look, we know it feels morally satisfying to try to engage in silencing and shouting down and deplatforming. It may make you feel good, but it's not going to do any good. You're trying to suppress the message, but instead those efforts are having an amplifying effect. So I am all in favor of doing everything we can to suppress the hateful ideas, to counter the hateful ideas, certainly to outlaw any hateful or discriminatory action. But going after the words is just a superficial quick fix that distracts from the actual hard work. You know, one of the things I learned, Brendan, in doing the research for my book is that Germany, for all of its very strict anti-hate speech laws, both during the Weimar period and now, Germany still has very strong anti-hate speech laws. And we know that there are terrible problems of ongoing anti-Semitism, including violence and and violence against um, refugees and against immigrants, to the extent that um, the head uh, of the Jewish community in Germany recently advised Jews not to wear the yarmulke, um, the skull cap that many uh, religiously observant Jewish men believe they have a religious obligation to wear, not to wear it in public in cities in Germany because there have been so many attacks on people who are openly identified as Jews. So if we really want to do something to reduce the violence, to reduce the discriminatory attitudes, we have to use education, we have to use persuasion, we have to use anti-discrimination laws. What I was going to say is Germany, for all of its strict hate speech laws, did not actually enact its first anti-discrimination law on the basis of religion, race, and so forth, in employment, uh, public accommodations, housing, and so forth, not until the 2000s. Uh, and then only because of pressure from the EU. Mm. So, and I think there's a direct correlation there. I can't prove a causal effect, but I wouldn't be surprised that um, when you think that you're doing enough because you're suppressing the speech, it, it's a distraction and deterrence from doing something that is more meaningful and more effective. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, France is a good example of exactly the problem that you're talking about. France outlawed Holocaust denial decades ago in 1990, I think. And France now has a very serious problem with anti-Semitism. There have been numerous anti-Semitic attacks, fatal attacks on Jewish people in France. Um, there have been public expressions of really genuine anti-Semitic hatred uh, on, on protests and on gatherings and so on. Um, French, the leaders of France have talked about how serious the problem of anti-Semitism has become. So certainly outlawing the racist ideology of Holocaust denial didn't do anything to solve the problem of anti-Semitism. And there could actually be a link between those two things, because as lots of free speech warriors say, if you push hateful ideas underground, 
if you push them outside of mainstream society, they can actually grow and fester and worsen in those darkened corners of the internet and in certain communities where we can't shine the light of reason or the light of truth. Um, so it, it, that's a very good outline, I think, of why even genuinely racist and hateful ideologies should have the freedom of expression. Because as you say, it, it, it simply isn't the case that censorship can can defeat those ideas. But is there another reason to this as well, which is that one of the problems is if we empower the state to determine what is a hateful ideology and to silence that hateful ideology, the problem there is that it expands the power of the state over the realm of thought and over the realm of speech and gives it a jurisdiction over our lives that it shouldn't enjoy. And, and that creates the danger, doesn't it, of other forms of speech being rebranded as hateful and therefore susceptible to censorship. Very, very correct. And so if I can summarize but your point and mine, we're saying, you know, the balancing analysis, there is not much of any good at all to be derived from these hate speech laws. They demonstrably do not um, stop hateful expression, let alone hateful ideas and actions from continuing, worse yet, may actually increase those problems. Uh, and on the other side of the balance, they're doing an enormous amount of harm by giving such subjective discretionary power to those who enforce them. I've read every single hate speech law that has been enacted or proposed, Brendan, and there is no way of drafting yourself out of the problem that this is an inescapably, inherently subjective concept. Hate, after all, is an emotion. It's a value judgment. Uh, you know, the laws typically use various synonyms from demeaning, disparaging, derogatory. Well, you know, no two human beings can agree about that. And in my book and in my public speaking, I like to give examples um, from current um, issues where one person's hate speech is somebody else's cherished ideology. So Black Lives Matter, many people consider to be the epitome of, of, of loving, inclusive uh, uh, advocacy for equal dignity and human rights. Uh, can't get more loving than that. And yet, Prominent politicians and others have attacked Black Lives Matter advocacy as hate speech against white people and against police officers. The American flag has been attacked as hate speech on college campuses because uh, they say it stands for imperialism, um, whereas in the United States as a whole, uh, when the, the public opinion polls and constitutional history show that the flag is the most cherished expression, when the Supreme Court upheld the First Amendment right to burn it, uh, we all almost instantly had enough votes to amend the Constitution to protect that speech. And yet you have college students considering it hate speech. Um, just the letters T-R-U-M-P have been denounced as hate speech on college campuses, whereas a substantial number of Americans, not enough to elect him, but a substantial number, nonetheless, uh, loved him enough to vote for him. That's a really good point about the redefinition of certain ideas or moral convictions as hateful ideologies. And I find that one of the most Orwellian trends of our time, because it really is a means through which someone's whole belief system can be not only demonized, but thrown open to possible punishment, possible censorship. So we, in the hate debate, which you've been covering really well for such a long time, there are two problems. On the one hand, there are genuine hateful ideologies like racism and anti-Semitism and genuine forms of misogyny where we would even defend the freedom to express those horrible ideas. On the other side, there is this quite broad now uh, redefinition of certain ways of thinking as hate. I'm thinking you've given some examples there. Black Lives Matter is seen as a hate group and as uh, engaging in hate speech by some people. Over here in the UK right now, I think a good example of this is um, the discussion on the trans issue and particularly someone like uh, J.K. Rowling. I mean, J.K. Rowling 
has never uttered one hateful word about trans people. And anyone who has read her essay on the trans issue or listened to anything she has said will know that that's the case. But she is frequently denounced as a hateful ideologue, someone whose speech is dangerous, someone who should be silenced. She's too big to cancel, so she enjoys that privilege as she herself recognises. But people who have expressed support for her have been cancelled, like the children's author Gillian Phillip, who lost her agent and lost her work because she put up a hashtag saying, I stand with J.K. Rowling. Other women who are not as fortunate as J.K. Rowling or not as wealthy, I guess, have suffered a similar fate. And that's a, that's one example. I mean, there are many others. As you say, your friend's concerned that someone could be denounced as an ist or an obe at any minute. That's a good example, isn't it, where a perfectly legitimate discussion about the boundaries from trans rights and and women's rights and the question of women's spaces and the questions of biology and the right to talk about these things is redefined in such a way that the the expectation is that it should be silenced and and shut down. And I think if I could try to um, describe the phenomenon that you're talking about, which the particular example, as well as many others, occurs in the United States, Brendan, it's this, that when people undeniably support the basic humanity and equality and dignity of people with various identities, but disagree with certain policy proposals about how to better advance, you know, equal status in society against certain problems of discrimination. Uh, In all good faith, disagree about particular means, they will immediately be denounced as haters. So you could be a complete believer in, you know, equality for trans people, but still be concerned about minors being, you know, competent to make lifelong decisions and, and, and therefore urge some slowdowns in the rush to um, surgery and, and hormone blockers and so forth. Um, and, and, and yet that would be enough to make you accused of being a transphobe. Or in the United States, you can be completely supportive of equal rights on the basis of race. You could be appalled uh, by the high number of police, unjustified police killings of unarmed black men. I should say there have been a, you know, disturbing number of police, unjustified police killings of people of other demographic groups, which don't get publicized as well. But, you know, putting that aside is certainly a problem in the, in the black community. But if you oppose the supposed remedy of defund the police, you can be accused of being a racist against black people. Another good example, which is going to be coming to the fore very soon with the Supreme Court decision, is affirmative action in higher education. You may actually believe that that is, has negative ramifications for racial equality and inclusion of minority students and, uh, and, and, and oppose affirmative action on that basis and yet be accused of being a racist. So this false equation between particular policy approaches, um, in my experience, mostly coming from the left now, uh, equating that falsely with denying humanity of the people at stake is very troubling. And that's a phrase that we hear on college campuses here all the time. Oh, and I'm sure you hear it about J.K. Rowling. There we hear it here. She is denying the humanity of trans people. Or, you know, they say that about other conservatives whose view I made policy views I may disagree with, but I've never heard them deny the humanity of anybody. This exaggerated rhetoric, I think, really does disservice to Martin Luther King and all of the heroes of the civil rights movement who really were having their humanity as well as their physical survival attacked so dramatically. 
If you're a regular listener to this show or a regular reader of Spiked, why not become a Spiked supporter? Spiked Supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked supporter and get access to lots of exciting perks. Spiked supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop and bookmark articles as you browse. This is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us and listen to us. We're incredibly grateful for your generosity. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. I wanted to ask you on, on those things you've just talked about there, how much you think this is a generational problem? I'm always reluctant to bash millennials and to bash Generation Z or, you know, the, the kind of blue haired brigade that tends to become a bit of a caricature who are running around campus and silencing people, although that unquestionably happens, partly because I think so many other influences and factors are feeding into the way they think and the way they behave. And lots of those influences come from older generations who have been institutionalizing new forms of censure for some time. But do you think there's a danger that society, Anglo and American society, has created a new generation that for various reasons, is quite intolerant. I mean, the example of the trans issue is, is a good one on this. If you think about Abigail, Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage, which is a really good book on... And I only read it because it was subject yeah. to so much censorship. So it perfectly illustrates this forbidden fruits phenomenon. I'm sure that she didn't want to be attacked, but I'm also sure that it elevated the readership of her book incalculably. Absolutely. And with that book, there were campaigns by younger members of the publishing industry and younger people at Amazon, for example, to make it unavailable for people to buy. Uh, There's a new book out in the UK called Time to Think by Hannah Barnes, which is the inside story of of the Tavistock Gender Clinic, which was a clinic that was treating young people for gender dysmorphia. And uh, that book was also rejected by numerous publishing houses, uh, according to the Sunday Times, because junior members of staff said they wouldn't work on it. And then beyond this issue, we've seen young people at Spotify demanding that they take down Joe Rogan's podcast because they find it offensive. We've seen other instances where uh, young people at Netflix, for example, saying we don't want to put up Dave Chappelle's comedy routines. And then the head of Netflix actually made a good statement about a year ago saying, look, if you're going to work here, you're going to have to help to produce content that you might find offensive and you might disagree with. So you talked earlier about the campus mentality spreading beyond campuses, and that's why FIRE has had to rebrand itself and take out the word education, because this is now a very broad problem. Do you think it's a generational thing, or, or, or what do you think is going on in, in relation to the younger people who seem quite intolerant? I would have to say both anecdotally and uh, in terms of survey evidence, what you say is sadly True, Brendan. I at, earlier on I talked about the surveys showing massive self censorship across all identity ca- categories, and then I said, "Well, to some there are some significant variations." And you're now giving me the opportunity to come back and stress what those are. Uh, and the two major variations that I'm aware of are with respect to age, uh, as you indicate. The other one is with respect to gender. Before I say more about the the latter, let me just say, if you look at all of the sectors in our culture that traditionally had a commitment to free speech, uh, where we've seen that weakening, from every indication, the weakening is coming from the younger, newer members of that, um, that, that, that sector. And certainly this is true for academia. I think that's where, where it started. Um, you mentioned publishing, there's journalism, there's entertainment, libraries, 
I mean, librarians are complaining that those who are coming out of library school now are not committed to necessarily shelving all books that uh, have some historic interest if they might have offensive ideas. Um, so it's a it's a it's a really significant problem that all of us have to um, constantly be attentive to. That could mean that. Disturbing as things are now, problematic as they are now, they might be on track to become even worse as this younger cohort rises in the leadership ranks of, of these institutions. Um, in terms of gender, uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, who's working on a new book and was co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind, as many of your listeners know, a very prominent social psychologist, uh, just began a new substack, and his first piece which was posted on it last week does address a disturbing data about um, a, a really significant, significantly higher percentage of women in particular on campuses who are in favor of censoring various kinds of controversial speech. Um, and that oddly, this occurs just at the time that the women are becoming dominant on campus. We, you know, we now have a majority of our undergraduates are, are women to the extent that there's really a concern about, you know, the gender gap, the opposite of the traditional gender gap. So this, this um, sense of uh, the anxiety mm -hmm. and, and depression um, that he thinks is animating calls for more protection from offensive words because they're harmful. So the psychological problems that are his expertise have been increasing among females just at the time that they are flourishing in terms of equal opportunity. So there's a real disconnect here. And there's another social psychologist, uh, Jean Twenge. I'm not sure if that's how you correctly pronounce her name, T-W-E-N-G-E, -E, who's written a lot about this. And I believe she has a new book coming out as well. Um, so again, you know, the solutions seem to be not necessarily to persuade people about free speech principles, but to address underlying psychological issues, uh, anxiety, depression, insecurity, and to persuade them that uh, shielding themselves from words is not going to improve their psychic or emotional health, quite to the contrary. Yeah, I think that's that, that brings me on to something I wanted to ask you about in relation to um, victim culture and, and how much... Uh, you could do a whole other podcast talking about what victim culture means, but I think people have a sense that younger people in particular, but many people tend to conceive of themselves as victims or as vulnerable these days, vulnerable to slights against their self-esteem or against their identity, vulnerable to words. The idea that words wound, for example, has been gathering ground for a long time now. And I wanted to ask you about that in particular, because I think there is this tendency among younger people in particular to think that words are so incredibly hurtful to them that they do have to be protected. They have to live in a safe space, to use campus terminology. Some of those safe spaces even recreate the conditions of childhood. So there will be colour in books. Uh, a campus here in the UK, I think it was Cambridge University, had a dog that people could pet if they felt stressed out so they could recreate that kind of uh, childish relationship with an animal. Apparently the dog had to be signed off duty because it was being stressed out by being petted by oh. so many students, oh. which was a real sign of the times. But in relation to the victim culture and the idea that words wound, I wanted to ask you how you address this question, because I think I've heard you say that words can be wounding. Words can be incredibly powerful. Otherwise, why would we spend our lives defending them? Uh, but we also, don't we also want to counter the idea that they're dangerous or hurtful to you to such an extent that you have to hide away from them. So how do you strike that balance between recognizing the power of words, but not wanting people to feel overawed by them? Excellent points, Brendan. So for one thing, it's I find it paradoxical and ironic that when I advocate, and more importantly, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, mandates counter speech, 
as a the appropriate response to hate speech or other controversial speech that you disagree with. You know, answer it back. Use persuasion. Use education. Use information, not censorship. Often those who advocate censorship will disparage and they say, oh, well, counter speech is only words, quote unquote, signifying that they have no power at all. In fact, that was the entire title of a famous leftist oriented uh, pro censorship book by the so-called radical feminist Catherine McKinnon a decade or two ago. Uh, it was she was, and the book was entitled Only Words and sarcastically she was referring to sexual expression that she demonized under the stigmatizing label pornography uh, that she believed had the power to um, discriminate against women and dehumanize women and lead to violence against women. Well, you can't have it both ways. I mean, if words are so impotent, uh, McKinnon wouldn't like me to use that word, but <laughs> let's say words were so powerless and feeble, why do we care about hate speech or pornography or disinformation? On the other hand, if they are so powerful, then we should acknowledge that the counter speech is as powerful as the hateful speech, the pornographic speech, whatever speech you're trying to censor. And I come down on the side that Words on both sides are enormously powerful, all words on every perspective, on every issue, and that is precisely why they are protected. The U.S. Supreme Court has said that expressly. And the way to counter what we have to focus is on, you know, the exact causal relationship that words play in various kinds of harm and the best way to counter that potential harm. There is no, you know, people will often mock that old saying in the United States, it's a nursery rhyme. I don't know if it's current in Britain as well, but sticks and stones will break my bones. Words will never hurt me. Well, it's not true that words will never hurt me, but it's also not true that words will always hurt me. The whole point of parents telling their kids that nursery rhyme was to get the kids to develop the resilience and the self-confidence and the other attitudes that would disempower the words from hurting them. There's a whole school of psychology that's quite ascendant, at least in the United States, cognitive behavior therapy that helps people to deal with the negative impact of various kinds of experience, including words, uh, not by silencing the words, not by taking shelter and retreating to childhood. That's certainly not going to equip you to function as an effective, uh, powerful adult in the real world. And, and what's encouraging about that, uh, and here I love the fact that we're having psychological experts such as John Haidt and others write about this, is that they say, you know, put aside the First Amendment principles, put aside free speech principles, just specifically focusing on the harm and pre pre preservation from this kind of emotional and psychological harm. Censorship is damaging. And more speech, including through therapy, uh, is is the effective way to mitigate the harm. Yeah. And, and that's been a long-standing belief prior to the modern era, at least, uh, in terms of you know, you develop yourself, your intellectual muscles and your ability to think for yourself and to be an autonomous, independent human being precisely through exposing yourself to disagreement, to discussion. I mean, everyone from John Milton to John Stuart Mill made that point. Cardinal John Henry Newman once said that the human intellect does from opposition grow. And it's precisely through opposition and the things that uh, young people are encouraged to fear that we become clearer thinkers, more rounded and freer people. I'm so sorry. We, there's so much of interest here. And thank you for the Newman quote, which I had not been aware of. I'll add that to my arsenal. Uh, we had talked about publishing and you had made some very good points that are replicated in the United States about publishers refusing to publish certain books or agents even refusing to represent the books. And now authors are not even writing the books because they fear they're not going to get published. Um, 
in response to that problem, a group of friends and colleagues of mine have founded a new press in the United States called the Heresy Press. It actually got some good coverage in a British publication recently, and that might be an interesting subject for another podcast. I think it's, you know, what's it's sad. I mean, it's exciting in one sense, but sad in the other with very limited publicity. The number of manuscripts that came pouring in from poets and writers of fiction and nonfiction across so many disciplines, absolutely brilliant works that felt that they just would never have a shot in the mainstream publishing world is very dismaying, but now they they have another outlet. So Nadine, I've got just a couple more quick things I want to ask you about before we finish. And um, following on from what we've been talking about, I think for me, as someone who defends freedom of speech from what I would consider to be a progressive position, who knows what that word means. It even means different things in the US than it does in the UK. Are you still a Marxist? Well, I wouldn't use the word Marxist anymore because I just think it doesn't make much sense in the 21st century. But it's whatever you are, I certainly consider you a person of the left. (laughs) Yeah. So I consider, I would say I come from a leftish perspective and that's how I've always thought of spiked and our argument for freedom of speech. And one of the ways in which I understand that, it, it, one of the things that frustrates me about the contemporary forms of cancel culture is that it's often done under the guise of protecting minority groups from offence, uh, from protecting African Americans from being offended or women from feeling offended or gay people. And I want to just grab these people by the scruff of their necks and say, do you not realise how paternalistic and backward that argument is? And One of the points you've made very eloquently over the years is that it was precisely through freedom of speech that those groups in society managed to build up their freedoms and their liberties and their equality. If the suffragettes hadn't had the freedom to publish pamphlets and to associate and to protest, uh, those developments in relation to women's rights wouldn't have come through. Um, you know, uh, the civil rights movement in the US often made the point that they it was only through the freedom to speak to each other and to engage in those discussions that they could push forward racial equality. Frederick Douglass famously said that slavery would not have survived if there had been freedom of speech, if slaves had suddenly been allowed to speak and to organize and to exchange ideas. Slavery would have collapsed, he said, in five years time. Um, So isn't that a real worry that we now have young people who call themselves radicals and progressives, but whose instinct is to protect groups rather than to expand their liberty and to censor rather than to engage in debate? I completely agree with you, Brendan. The silver lining to that cloud is that once you summarize a little bit of that history for people who are unaware of it, and it is mostly ignorance of history that's the problem here, it really gives them a new perspective. I have to say that, you know, I have always separated my role as an educator from my role as an advocate, but in fact, information about the history of free speech and the history of censorship and what the impact of them actually have been on various causes, including causes of the left and human rights causes, really is an eye-opener. And um, so... I I also want to say that today also it's important to give examples to young people. I mean, that's why I, I, I love to point out, so I'm sad that it's happening, but that you support Black Lives Matter. You have to know that the censorship tools that you're advocating, including repression of hate speech, is something that has been advocated to be used against the speech that you love of leftist messages. And, and most importantly, Brandon, this is not a coincidence. It goes back to that problem we talked about earlier, the inherent subjectivity and hence manipulability of the concept of hate speech. It basically empowers whoever has the enforcing authority to pick and choose whichever ideas are unpopular among dominant majority groups. And so therefore, over and over and over again, hate speech laws are to this day being used disproportionately to silence the voices of the very minority groups that are hoped to be benefited. My book cites example after example from countries around the world, um, 
reports by international agencies. Um, they are all deploring. And this is not just an abuse of hate speech laws. This is an inherent problem that flows from the inevitable subjectivity and hence discretionary power that's wielded in enforcing hate speech laws. Yeah, that's that's very well put. And Nadine, the last thing I wanted to ask you was about your forthcoming book, which you've mentioned, um, Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know. Uh, you've given us a, a really good taste of what people need to know in this podcast. But what can what can people expect from the book? When's it coming out? And what is your general argument that you're going to push in that book? It's coming out in the fall from Oxford University Press, which has a trademarked series called What Everyone Needs to Know about various subjects. And even though it's existed for about 15 years, there was not a book about free speech, which was too bad, <laughs> but I thought it was good. It's a good opportunity for me. The book is in question and answer format. That's the trademark of the series. And I love that, Brendan, because since 2017, I've basically been speaking nonstop, answering people's questions. So I know what people need to know. I know what they want to know because they've been telling me and asking me. And I set up a really good challenge for myself because I do believe, uh, with, along with John Stuart Mill, that everything is subject to questioning and re-examination and debate, including my long-held views about the importance and value of freedom of speech. So right at the beginning of the book, uh, the, one of the very first questions I ask is, what are the dozen most challenging, most difficult arguments against free speech. I lay them out and uh, hopefully I answer them in ways that I persuaded myself, you know, to the best of my ability, I am open-minded. And if somebody persuaded me that censorship would be justified in terms of promoting human rights, equality, dignity, something else that I consider uh, a very important value, I would be persuaded to support it. But so far, I haven't seen the, the evidence. Nadine Strassen, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brandon.